Hello, and welcome to the third Anatomy and Physiology Journal Club. My name is Laird Sheldahl. I'm an instructor at Mount Hood Community College in Gresham, Oregon. And today, I'd like to talk about a recent publication in the field of hearing research. As usual, I would like to focus on material that I teach my students in my 200 level a &P class. The goal is to illustrate how some of the boring facts that I teach in my class can actually help students to understand some of the current advances in biomedical research. And today's topic is on noise-induced hearing loss. This condition affects about 5% of people worldwide, but that number can go up to 25% for military veterans. In fact, noise-induced hearing loss is the most common disability for U.S. military veterans today. The article I'm focusing on was published in 2017 in the journal Cell Reports, wherein the authors describe a novel protocol for growing an important type of cell involved in hearing known as a hair cell. Before we get to hair cells, let's review some of the ways that cells can communicate with other cells. In the second term anatomy class, we talked a lot about neurons, which could release chemicals called neurotransmitters, which diffuse just a tiny distance across a synaptic cleft to signal to neighboring cells. Whereas the endocrine system utilizes the circulatory system. Cells and endocrine glands can release chemicals into the bloodstream, which allows these chemicals to travel throughout the body to numerous distant locations. And when they leave the bloodstream, they can activate a number of different cells throughout the body, leading to a coordinated response. With paracrine signaling, cells release chemicals that diffuse a short distance away to act on nearby cells. We saw a number of examples of this in the first term anatomy class. Inflammation was one example. Damaged cells can release prostaglandins, which diffuse a short distance away, to act on nearby arteries, causing vasodilation. This in turn led to redness and swelling that we see with the inflammatory response. We also learned that when you exercise the biceps, Muscle cells can release growth hormone and testosterone, which leads to hypertrophy, or an increase in size and strength of the muscle being exercised. Other muscles, however, would not respond. A third example was with tanning. When keratinocytes are damaged by UV light, they release the chemical MSH, which diffuses to nearby melanocytes and triggers them to release melanin causing darkening of the skin in that area. Places where the sun don't shine, however, do not turn darker. For those who were paying attention in class, you may also remember that MSH was produced by the pituitary gland and could be released into the bloodstream, affecting our appetite and reproductive systems. Today, I will be focusing on paracrine signaling. And specifically, a class of molecules known as growth factors, which are very important in the growth and regeneration of tissues. To hear a sound, we must first convert vibrations in the air into electrical signals. Sound waves traveling up the external acoustic meatus will bump into a little flap of skin known as the tympanic membrane, causing it to vibrate. The tympanic membrane represents the divider between the external ear and the middle ear. And it's in the middle ear that we find three little bones known as the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And these can act as little levers, both transmitting and amplifying the sound waves to the inner ear. And it's here, inside of tiny little tubes filled with a fluid known as endolymph, that waves will be converted into electrical signals. Specifically, 
in a region of the inner ear known as the cochlea. Vibrations in the endolymph will cause a structure known as the tectorial membrane to vibrate. This is located close to a cluster of cells, collectively known as the organ of corti. It's within this organ that the hair cells are located. Hair cells come in two separate groups. There is a cluster of inner hair cells, and cleverly enough, a second group known as outer hair cells. When the tectorial membrane vibrates, it can push on stereocilia of the inner hair cells, which causes ion channels to open up, and sound waves are converted into electrical signals. And these signals are sent to the brain, where we interpret that as sound. The outer hair cells, on the other hand, receive signals from the brain. And when these get signals from the brain, they will push on the tectorial membrane, which will amplify the movements of the tectorial membrane, making it easier for us to hear sound. Damage to either group of hair cells can lead to problems with hearing. Also within the organ of corti are other cells collectively known as support cells. In the developing embryo, some of these support cells can actually be converted into hair cells if necessary, meaning they act like stem cells. However, this ability is lost in adulthood. In the current publication, the hope was to isolate some of these support cells and make them forget that they were adult cells and instead behave more like they did when they were embryos and hopefully grow into hair cells if necessary. In order to do this, the authors first had to divide the support cells into two different groups, one which expressed a protein on the surface called LGR5, and others that did not. The ones that did were cleverly called LGR5 positive cells, and these are the ones that were most capable of turning into hair cells. When we are embryos, the main job of most of our cells is to divide rapidly, causing us to grow bigger. But at some point, these cells will have to start doing jobs. This is a process known as differentiation. For instance, a stem cell might differentiate into a hair cell, growing stereocilia and expressing ion channels. Or a stem cell might turn into a support cell. Now we need both of these in the cochlea, but it's the hair cells that are most likely to get injured. During differentiation, a stem cell must make a decision as to what type of cell it will become when it's an adult, and this is usually guided by growth factors. Today, the most important one will be a molecule known as a Wnt, and this can drive a stem cell to turn into a hair cell. What we would like to do today, however, is to make some of these support cells turn into hair cells. Differentiation can be thought of as moving down one side of a hill or another. And going up the hill, it turns out, is rather difficult. And that's because when cells differentiate, they often permanently or semi-permanently turn off DNA that they no longer need. A support cell, for instance, will no longer need genes to make stereocilia. And so these regions of DNA can be tightly packed around histones, which effectively silences those genes and just stores that information. To get a support cell to forget that it's a support cell, the authors had to unravel some of these genes using a class of molecules known as 
histone deacetylase inhibitors. These drugs could inhibit the activity of histones and unpackage some of the DNA. Then, with the right Wnt signal, this cell could be induced to form a hair cell. To completely regrow a damaged organ is called regeneration, and not all animals are as good at it as others. For instance, amphibians can completely regenerate their inner ear. And tadpoles, at least, are able to regenerate missing limbs. Birds can also regenerate the inner ear. However, they are not capable of replacing missing limbs. Humans aren't good at either one of those. However, there are some tissues we are capable of regenerating. For instance, the liver is pretty good at it, as is the skin. And if we look at skin regeneration, we'll learn a few things that will be applicable to the cochlea. The skin is composed of two basic layers. The outer epidermis is a stratified squamous epithelium. And the inner dermis is composed of some areolar connective tissue and some dense irregular connective tissue. It's here in the dermis that we find the important blood vessels that carry all of the nutrients to this tissue. When the skin gets injured, damaged cells can release inflammatory molecules, such as prostaglandins, which lead to nearby vasodilation, bringing more blood into the area, which can lead to the formation of a scab or granulation tissue. This seals up the injury and prevents blood loss and infection. This will also attract nearby white blood cells, such as the neutropils and monocytes that we discussed a few weeks ago. These will help clean up any debris and help in the formation of this granulation tissue. That was the first step. The second step is going to be a phase of growth. And first off, angiogenic signals are released, which stimulate the growth of new capillaries into the injured site. This will cause any forming scar to appear reddish. We must also grow new cells. For instance, damaged epithelial cells will release wince, which stimulate stem cells to divide and create more epithelial cells, sealing off the injured site. These wints can also drive division of fibroblasts, which will migrate into the area and start producing collagen. This will convert the granulation tissue into something that resembles scar tissue. Our third phase of wound repair was a remodeling phase. It's not enough just to make a bunch of collagen and epithelial cells. We need to turn these into the tissues that we had initially. Other signals can be released which will cause these changes. For instance, other growth factors can cause these epithelial cells to differentiate into keratinocytes. They may also cause the fibroblasts to differentiate into fibrocytes. And instead of making scar tissue, this will be remodeled into the dense irregular connective tissue and areolar connective tissue that we had before. Extra fibroblasts can also be removed by apoptosis. Apoptotic signals can also lead to the removal of some of these now unneeded capillaries. And when this happens, what had been a reddish scar will now look more like the original skin that was there in the first place.
It's important to keep in mind that today's study was carried out in petri dishes in a lab. But let's compare it to something done in a clinical setting, a bone marrow transplant. Where stem cells from the bone marrow of a donor are removed and transplanted into a patient. Normally, you would worry about a patient's immune system rejecting foreign cells, but of course you've replaced their immune system. The other problem that we commonly see with stem cell therapies is that we often can't get that many stem cells in the first place. With a bone marrow transplant, that's not a problem, but here we can only collect a few support cells from the cochlea, which is a very tiny organ. So the first step was to induce these support cells to divide and by stimulating the Wnt signaling pathway, that's what the authors were first capable of doing. Once we have a large collection of cells, we then must make them forget that they are adult cells. And that is, of course, where those histone deacetylase inhibitors came into play. We now had a large group of stem cells and when we gave these cells WINTS and other signaling molecules, such as activating the notch pathway, the authors were capable of causing many of these support cells to instead differentiate into hair cells. Now it's easy for me to draw a hair cell, but it was actually tricky to prove that the cells in the Petri dish were actually hair cells. And that involved looking at gene expression and even a little bit of morphology. We could see that some of the new cells were creating structures that resembled stereocilia. The authors also did a type of experiment known as an explant, wherein they took the organ of corti from mouse cochlea, cut it out, and stuck it in a petri dish and then using the same signaling molecules, induced some of the support cells in those organ of corti explants to turn into hair cells. The authors predicted that within 18 months, they might be able to use these same growth factors on humans. And rather than trying to grow hair cells in Petri dishes, actually induce the growth of hair cells in damaged cochleus. To do this, the authors suggest that they would be able to inject these chemicals into the middle ear. So how would those chemicals get from the middle ear to the inner ear and specifically into the uh, endolymph of the cochlea? That takes advantage of a structure called the round window. This was a thin membrane, which the authors suggest that the chemicals would be able to diffuse across to get inside the cochlea. Ultimately, we need to get these drugs into the endolymph of the cochlear duct found uh, in the center here. And then hopefully, induce cell division of some of those support cells, and then convince some of those to differentiate into hair cells, hopefully reducing noise-induced hearing loss or possibly even reversing some deafness. Now, 18 months is a pretty important number. It usually takes a lot longer than that to go from a basic biology experiment in a Petri dish to translate that into something you're doing in human patients. I suspect that this is because many of the chemicals that the authors are using have already been approved by the FDA and are known to be safe in the treatment of other conditions in humans. And they might also have some other information that they haven't published yet. So pay attention to this story. If you would like to learn more, you can read any of these primary research articles. None of them are behind a paywall. 
keep an eye out for further developments in this story, not only in the field of hearing, but in other fields as well, because wints are involved in the growth of skin, the liver, intestines, and beta islet cells in the pancreas that are lost with type 1 diabetes. So once again, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next month.